and then uh, I'll share my screen and um, I'll make some comments. Um, so this is work actually done with uh, with Wade, um, our our you know exceptional TA, um, but also Karsten and and uh, Karsten Hempel, a uh, um, um, research associate at uh, U of A, who I co-supervised as a postdoc for uh, a while with Alex Dorshenko and Alex Dorshenko um, himself. Um, and Karsten is is also an exceptional modeler, and uh, this this focused on um, the the bacterial infection pertussis, which many people don't realize has uh, imposes a, um, a growing amount of burden because of waning vaccination rates. And for for infants, it can be particularly dangerous, um, uh, and and can in some cases tragically be lethal. Um, uh, with two thirds experiencing dyspnea, trouble breathing, and, and a half uh, half of infants who who get uh, pertussis, who contract uh, pertussis, being hospitalized. Um, now, for adults, it's often asymptomatic or it can be nonspecific, uh, although complications can can rise. And one of the big uh, you know the big concerns here is is after many decades of having good vaccination rates um, between vaccination complacency and vaccine hesitancy, and unfortunately trends that seem like they might've been worsened by the florid conspiracy theorizing, the wacko conspiracies about vaccination that came up during you know, the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has really uh, uh, have, have combined to to compromise uh, vaccination rates. Vaccination um, has also been lessened because it's been out of mind of many people during the COVID-19 pandemic and it's been harder to attend well baby clinics, et cetera. Um, pertussis is, a, um, um, is notable for having very high rates of waning and it typically requires administrations of six six to eight vaccines per person. Um, uh, and um, uh, yes, uh, conspiracy theories, unfortunately, present uh, prior to COVID-19. Yeah, in the UK, there are weird conspiracy theories about pertussis that tanked the rates there of pertussis vaccination, I think in the 80s or so, maybe it was 70s or 80s, and led to big pertussis outbreaks um, uh, during that time that were uh, very dangerous. Um, uh, there was some weird thinking that it, that it was linked to autism, I think, or what have you. And it, it, it led to frightening of a lot of people that didn't get their kids vaccinated and big pertussis outbreaks that could threaten the lives of infants. Um, so um, uh, in, in Alberta, um, there's pretty good rates of vaccination. But what's really notable is that um, that there's real clustering of, of poor vaccination rates um, uh, by uh, towns. And then importantly, within uh, schools and within families. And I, I emphasize the latter too, because um, families and schools are two of the settings in which pertussis spreads most. And you know, if a, a, a school has chronically under-vaccinated kids, there can easily be outbreaks in the schools. Um, in an earlier work that's published with agent-based modeling with Alex Doroshenko and Winchell Chen and others, we, we focused on outbreak response immunization campaigns focused on schools and particularly uh, adolescents and schools. But families are also a point of concern because of course, within a family, you have many family members come into contact with a baby. And if you have many members of that family who are under vaccinated or unvaccinated, there's real risk that it may be transmitted uh, within the family to the baby. And, and you know, based on this, people have spoken about the importance of cocooning in a family, of vaccinating a family um, before a birth so that the, um, uh, the family is protected um, from you know, coming to contact with pertussis while, um, during the, uh, the uh, infant's earliest years. Um, 
And the acute, there's been acute concerns about this because of notable outbreaks in the past 10 and 15 years among unvaccinated groups, particularly unvaccinated adolescents and in schools in Alberta. Um, so, so this is an agent-based model and, and often when characterizing model um, scope, we, we characterize model components into endogenous features, features that are generated by the model. This is what the model is generating. Exogenous features, which are represented in the model, like endogenous ones, but, but with exogenous, we're making fixed assumptions, pre-specified assumptions would be a better way to put it. The assumptions are specified to us. Endogenous things are things the model tells to us. We don't set them. Um, uh, it tells us. And that last model we looked at for calibration, it was generating the number of infections over time. We, we don't specify this number of infections at that time, that number of infections at that time. No, no, no. It's generating them based on the other assumptions. Exogenous things are things we specify to the model. Maybe it's, you know, some assumption about unemployment rate as it might affect, you know, um, community stresses and risk of suicidal ideation. Or maybe it's, you know, uh, assumptions about availability of vaccines or, or what have you, but they're pre-specified. Um, and ignore are things that are left out altogether. This was an endogenously rich model, a model that included many factors, including things such as um, uh, vaccine, um, uh, vaccine adherence and, and vaccine um, level of vaccination at different ages that in many models are, are presupposed or exogenously specified. Here, they were endogenous. The model produced them. And the model had processes like vaccine catch up where the, where the family would, you know, if it took a child in to a pediatrician and said, well, oh, oh, this child's actually three vaccines behind for their, uh, for their DTaP, for their pertussis vaccine, let's catch them up. That would be simulated in the model. We, we wanted to understand um, factors that might drive um, um, vaccination um, uh, adherence and lack thereof, because it affect it, it was very important for waning of vaccine of, of vaccine efficacy and therefore vulnerability, vulnerability within a family, vulnerability um, um, within um, within a a, a, a uh, school or or um, more broadly in the community. So here, you know, if you had agents, they were born um, between over their life course. This is kind of a life course model to receive vaccinations. They go to school for a while. Um, um, uh, they could become a parent at some time. And of course, in their parenthood, they're still inheriting whatever vaccines they received earlier. The, the occurrence of vaccines are shown here with these, um, um, with these sort of lines, these arrows. Um, and, um, and at some point they might uh, give birth. Um, and we had a lot of attention to fertility and, and so on. Um, um, because this focus on maternal immunization, we, we needed to represent um, reproduction in a little bit uh, greater detail. And so there's age and family structure specific fertility where we're trying to match um, the uh, age distributions, um, in, in households, um, uh, the a number of children in households, and um, and sort of the distribution among households of different of different sorts. Understanding household size, because household composition is is a factor that plays into risk of pertussis infection, and we had sort of characterization of of, of vaccination, uh, whereby um, a given um, child could be in a state of, of um, not, not actually, I think this may have been more at the household level, but um, of not being um, kind of having fallen off the track of compliance on the one hand, um, uh, and, um, and then uh, on schedule. Yeah, the autism vaccine link is, 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 has been thoroughly discredited um, by, by scientific study, but it's one of those zombie ideas that continues to live on and, and wreak public health havoc, unfortunately, um, because some celebrity said it one time. Um, 
Uh, so, so someone could be, uh, it could be non-compliant or it could be on schedule. And while they're on schedule, you know, they're paying attention to the vaccination delivery. If they're non-compliant, they're just checking out and they're not um, being, they're not on schedule. So the model produced vaccination coverage at different ages, you know, out of this. And, and we captured contact because, because of the routes of contact and this idea of needing to protect a child and, and so on. Um, um, we, we captured contacts of multiple sorts. Um, um, uh, contacts within the home and within a household, sort of the, the, the empty circ, uh, squares there within schools. Um, and, and then there's particular persons in family networks. So a person has family connections, they have school connections. We didn't go into workplace connections because we didn't think that there, there didn't seem to be a lot of evidence that they were, you know, implicated in a lot of pertussis transmission. Um, so kids here would go to school, they'd spend time at school, they'd spend time at home, and, you know, they could bring the infection home from school. Um, um, and, uh, and, you know, some of their siblings would be at the same school or other schools, um, might bring it around and a baby, a new baby might be uh, at home, for example. Um, so we had multiple types of, of contacts and we, we actually spent a lot of time, you know, getting the, the contact dynamics right. Um, um, I'm not going to go into the immunological dynamics, but this was a model that had some kind of multi-level structure. So the idea is, you know, built up, um, built up uh, uh, a degree of protection against a given, um, um, against pertussis. And then it would wane over time. So if someone were infected, whoop, um, um, they would zip up in their protection level, and then it would kind of wane, and they would zip up again. And, and this is a pretty um, typical sort of model that is reflective of how waning takes place in infectious diseases. You know, you you get some protection from a, of a from a um, uh, immunization, and then it wanes. And and for COVID nineteen, I'll I'll note that this is notable and, you know, we're all waning right now and, and, um, and it's going to be a big impact um, uh, very likely by next fall because there's a lot of people resting on the laurels of earlier vaccinations, which actually wane quite quickly, particularly given, you know, new variants coming in. But another thing that could boost them up would be if they were naturally infected. So if they, if they were infected. And, I won't go into it, but we had a wholesale a cellular vaccine as well as natural infection represented. And there was a whole set of dynamics associated with this um, that in other settings um, I've gone into with others who model the immune system, but I, I won't go into it. But one very important point is that we actually characterized the, the protection to infants that comes from um, two different sources. One is from um, vaccination, but the other is from um, what's called passive immunity through maternal uh, antibodies. And these are very well studied sort of quantities. And, and uh, at time of birth, um, um, some of the mother's antibodies um, uh, are circulating in the baby and, and stay in the baby for a matter of, of, of some months. Um, not for years really, but for, for months. Um, over the course of months and they protect that baby. Um, and one of the things we wanted to investigate here was how maternal immunization, so immunization during pregnancy in the third trimester would impact protection uh, for the baby. And it could protect it in two different means. One is it would boost the baby's uh, protection level, um, um, the, the protection level of the infant to a higher level. Um, but it would also protect the mother. And by protecting the mother, it would lower the chance that the mother could be exposed to pertussis, say, through a, a cousin to the baby or you know, through other family connections or by circulating among other mothers, and then bring the baby, the, the protection home um, to the infant, um, to, their, to the, the infection home in a way that would risk infecting their infant. Um, 
I'm not going to go into the details of that, but it was uh, grounded by um, the literature, both in terms of immunology and other models, et cetera. Um, now, the model had a, a lot of parameters that were estimated from other papers and from the literature. Um, but uh, to, to this point, it had a really big emphasis on calibration. And there were five main, five or six main parameters that were calibrated here. Um, and they're shown here. Um, they have to do with contact rates at school and home um, and, and in the community, uh, as well as um, kind of this exogenous infection rate from outside, um, you know, that might reflect travelers, for example, which are known to have caused outbreaks in uh, Alberta for pertussis and or measles. And I'm, I'm having trouble remembering it was particularly pertussis, measles, or both. Um, and and I, I probably should have noted that schools here um, uh, were characterized as having kind of an overall school level attitude towards vaccination, which was, was um, reflected then in the, in the kind of distribution of families associated with the school to capture the fact that schools often um, have real differences school to school in terms of level of vaccination rate and by extension attitude towards vaccination. But one of the things I wanted to talk about here was the discrepancy function. This is probably the most salient thing because of where this is in the boot camp and its juxtaposition and motivation through calibration. So the idea here is we have a discrepancy function. Why do we have a discrepancy function? Because we're trying to adjust these parameters such that we minimize the discrepancy between, on the one hand, values from the model X and values from the world Y. Um, and it's a weighted sum of discrepancies with respect to four different types of differences, of sub discrepancies. Um, um, each of these types of sub discrepancies characterize discrepancy with respect to um, you know, some type of, of observable. Um, and um, there were four of them here. Um, and, and, and each of these were formulated with, with a dis sub discrepancy function that was kind of inspired by a likelihood function. It was sort of a pseudo likelihood. Um, and uh, to sort of read this, um, what you get is um, um, a difference. Okay, it's a difference in the mean from the model versus the mean number of infections, sort of the corresponding value from the world, number of infections in the world. Um, and, and this was um, value of a normal distribution. So if these two are the same, a normal distribution peaks at its middle. Um, this is a, a zero, um, uh, a, a, a value at, um, of, of the discrepancy centered at zero. And so um, it would be at its maximum. And uh, you would get a, um, a log of, of, of that, which is, is, is equal to, to zero. And minus that would be, would, would be zero as well. And so, but if, if these were further away from each other, it'd be a lower value of that. And essentially that term in this would be smaller. Um, um, it would be a, a quantity whose log would be, would be negative and, and therefore the minus of it would be positive. And so would be, so basically this would decrease as these two are further and further apart. It's a sub discrepancy function that if X and Y are, are you know, uh, the, the same, uh, give the exact same value. This is gonna have a value of zero. And so there's no discrepancy, but as these two draw further and further apart, it's gonna have a bigger value. Um, and, um, and then it's multiplied by a weight here, which kind of reflected how much, um, how much emphasis we wanna put in. We had another one, which was the cumulative distribution function um, associated with this kind of viewing um, year to year, um, the 
number of infections is kind of a distribution. We are trying to ma match, match that as well. So this is a cumulative density of yearly incidents. So um, we're trying to match that. So we tried to match mean incidents, cumulative density. So across different years, it's variable. And if you wanted to kind of match, the, you know, how does it vary year to year? How much is high numbers versus low numbers? You could define a cumulative density function as saying, you know, there are some years where you have up to, you know, dozens uh, near 50 um, incidents uh, here. And, and then there are some years where you just have a handful uh, of incidents. And what does that cumulative density function look like uh, for this? Um, and then we have two other terms here. Um, uh, this age-based, this is age distribution of incidents. So how many, you know, how much incidence occurs in the one to four year age group or four to 10 versus the first year of life, um, infancy there. Um, and we were trying to measure, to match all of those. After all, the model has age and has schools for the appropriate ages and, you know, kids going from school to school and age structures of families. So we want to match that. And then we want to match yearly uh, incidence, what's called the autocorrelation function, which basically will say, you know, if you had a, a high number today, how does, how does that associate with uh, whether you're likely to have a high number the next year or the year beyond that or the year beyond that? Does it sort of having a high number now drain the number of susceptibles? So if you have a high number now, it leads to a lot fewer uh, later. And we tried to match this autocorrelation function. And this is the one where we didn't do great, but we didn't do horrible either. It, 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 it matched, you know, um, in a way that's not totally embarrassing. Um, uh, so we were matching all of these. And we also matched this risk ratio, as I recall, since last vaccine dose and vaccine coverage uh, also. We, we needed it to match those, those things that we see from the world. Um, uh, so this, this is something that's measured um, empirically. Um, so essentially we were minimizing this function. This is what I would call a fairly heroic calibration efforts. We have other models that go like this, but, but the types of things that it tried to match up are you know, a little bit distinctive. I mean, it was trying to match up different types of data here um, and, it, and it ended up matching quite well. Um, this is a graph of, uh, as I understood it, uh, from the contact patterns that come from the model. And uh, the idea is that um, if you go look at the literature on, on contacts within the population, mixing patterns, you find that there's well-established understanding that you know, people have contact most with people of similar age. That may be their spouse, it may be siblings, it may be kids in the same school, you know, the same classroom uh, at school, um, uh, what have you. Um, but there's a lot of contact also with uh, people uh, a generation older than you, might be your parents, for example, your aunties and uncles or those, once you reach an appropriate age of childbearing, et cetera, uh, those a decade younger than you, maybe those are your kids or, or your nieces and nephews, et cetera. And, and so people have, have studied in different countries what this contact matrix looks like. Um, they've sought to, to measure it. We've done a lot of that work with smartphone-based data collection where you can record automatically connections. Um, but others have done it through surveys and so on. And, and, and basically the model generates this sort of data. This emerges from the model because contact is, you can't just put this in. This isn't something that's, you know, you can just stick into the model because the model generates contacts from occurring at school or occurring at home or occurring in the community. And, and that collectively needs to match up with this this type of data, and it matches very well, this sort of empirical data. Um, so this was another sort of criteria of, of validation that we undertook with the model. And I believe these, these also were kind of validation criteria. We didn't calibrate against them, but we expected the model to, to match adequately 
uh, against them. And you know, from this, we got out values of calibrated parameters. Um, we got out values of the parameters that allowed for these sort of matches. And having so done, we could then run the model in various scenarios and study the effectiveness of maternal vaccination and, and conduct sensitivity analyses involving different types of assumptions, which are not firmly established, um, um, such as whether maternal immunization blunts antibody, natural antibody re um, responses in infants, or if we assumed that we were really good, like the cases we get are most of the cases out there, whether they're only a fraction of all individuals getting sick and we're missing most, um, see to what degree our assumptions hang on that or whether the model results are totally different if we assume that, um, or if we assume vaccines were administered against 50 per, uh, by, across 50% 50 versus 75% of pregnancies, we could vary that and see how did that affect our results. Um, or if we assumed, um, uh, if we were to assume only that it that the maternal immunization doesn't help the infant directly, only by protecting the mother, how much does that? How much of the effect of protection comes through the mother being being protected from from um, from infection? Um, and we run the model uh, because it's stochastic. We ran at thirty realizations each. Um, this is Wade realized um, the details of this model, much of it. And so he'd be a great person to speak to if you want to ask him. So population size of 500,000, we ran it for 50 years. And we had a rel relative to, uh, to uh, UGS uh, question, we had a 20 year burn-in period before maternal immunization begins. So um, uh, long and short, um, we, uh, we found under these different sensitivity analyses, um, um, including alternative durations of passive immunity, we found high levels of efficacy of maternal immunization for pertussis. Um, and uh, basically we were getting um, levels of vaccine effectiveness in the um, levels from 60s to 90s where most of them uh, for vaccine effectiveness or in the 80s and not, well, for vaccine effectiveness in the 80s for 90s. And much of the effect was from, from vaccination, some from the cocooning effect by vaccinating the mother. Um, and we found that even if you assumed blunting, even if you assume this kind of uh, pessimistic assumption that look, by vaccinating the mother, you're gonna blunt the ability of the baby to naturally develop antibody responses for a year because it will rest on the laurels of, of, of its antibody res responses, you still get very good levels of vaccine effectiveness given that. I mean, in other words, um, that doesn't mean it's a showstopper and, you know, in um, fact, th that maternal immunization no longer confers benefit. No, it confers high benefit. Um, it doesn't undercut the benefit. So, you know, um, the message of the story is, look, in, in the age of falling vaccination rates, pertussis has a real danger it poses to infants. And, and um, that, that danger um, can be, um, you know, is, is mediated by both active and passive immunity. Um, and one of the things that makes pertussis so difficult to deal with is rapid waning of immunity. Um, and by taking into these factors into account explicitly in a model um, um, and racing about the different transmission routes, those at homes and schools particularly, we can evaluate you know, the, the, the gains from maternal immunization and demonstrate that it's actually highly effective even given wide ranges of assumptions about possible alternative interpretations of of the scientific evidence or, or possible, you know, theories about how how it inter, interacts with infants' own immunology, it's highly highly effective. Um, cocooning is a, is important, but um, maternal vaccination looks to be uh, very efficacious. And you know, from the calibration side, what we 
what we found is that we 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 set a um, aggressive target for calibrating the model, for matching the model up with data. We calibrate it with a wide variety of types of model of of data. Rather, we we held we held it responsible to achieve high fidelity between the model and reproducing a variety of types of patterns from the world. Um, and uh, it was up to snuff. It, it was able to achieve that, although it involved some you know, alterations perhaps at, at, towards the end and, and elements of model assumptions to achieve that level of calibration, it was ultimately successful. And uh, you know, a model like this, um, uh, having been calibrated, uh, can serve as a really potent, potent vehicle for looking at things like vaccine effectiveness um, in this complex milieu of, you know, uh, 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 the preg time of pregnancy, after birth, the, the maternal um, contact, uh, both both providing maternal immunizations and um, uh, and in having contact with the baby, et cetera. So just a study that uses calibration. Um, so the question was, was the calibration uh, done in the, um, in the calibration, in the, um, the burn-in period, or was it done, uh, done in the main model simulation? So calibration would be done um, uh, in a separate step. So th these scenarios were with the calibrated model. Before this took place, you'd be calibrating. And, and what would happen is, remember calibration is to set parameter assumptions. It's to establish parameter assumptions to allow the model to best match observed data. And, and so what we would do in calibration is run the model through a comparable burn-in period, as I recall it, um, uh, with those parameter assumptions. And those parameter assumptions would continue all throughout. And we'd be trying to match up the model with those, you know, elements of observed um, data um, throughout that, and so it would, the parameter assumptions would be established at the model start and continue all the way through the model, and we'd be recording the outcomes from the model only after the burn-in period. This is what it means to have a burn-in period. It means you, that's kind of throwaway time where. It's just dealing with initial transients of the model, the initial, as the model gets in balance, as UGA have been asking about, the initial state of the model might be in a bit of disequilibrium with respect to other assumptions. And so it just allows the model to kind of get into a, a state of balance before you start paying really attention to it so that our results aren't totally thrown off by, by the initial assumptions. And so we'd be establishing the parameters all through that time, but looking for the model to reproduce these empirical patterns. Um, and so it's the calibration is done throughout the entire time frame. Um, uh, but we, we aren't forecasting there. We're just doing, uh, I'm sorry, I, I should be clear here. When I say in calibration the entire time frame, that's for the historic time frame. Um, so the model starts, I think, at something like um, it, it starts uh, earlier. And then runs runs forward, and and then we're seeing um, it uh, match up the historic data for the historic time frame. That's what the calibration involves. And then uh, in the actual scenarios, that's where we're projecting forward. That's where we're looking forward fifty years, um, including um, um, fifty years, and I think that's thirty years after the burn-in period. Um, so that's the projective uh, regime. That's the regime of sort of predicting forward. The calibration involves a historic period where we're comparing model results versus observed data. And um, I don't know if uh, Wade is here, but uh, maybe he could confirm if he is, um, uh, whether the model uh, also, um, uh, is comparing, yeah, I, I don't know if Wade's here. There he is. Uh, yeah. If the uh, Wade is, is the, uh, during calibration, it had a 20 year burn-in period as well, is that right? Yes. Yeah, 
and then and then it'll be the historic period where you're comparing model results against caliber against uh, comparable empirical results. Correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So credit credit is Wade. I'm just the messenger here. This is awesome work, and Wade is one of the key enablers uh, for it. Uh, Wade's a master at these and his um, amazing models to his effect, including those used for COVID-19 planning here in Canada and, and in Australia. Um, this is my question. I'm wondering whether there's a limit for a system science approach. There absolutely are, are limits, yeah. Uh, uh, another system was not considered as cross-reactivity with other uh, react respiratory pathogens. You could see how this would add several other systems. Yeah, I think this is a, um, in, you know, an interesting uh, point. Uh, um, so, um, with with system science, um, you know, system science is not a a magic bullet. It's a learning tool to help us learn more quickly and more deeply and more reliably about systems. But it, it's it's not something which. Um, uh, totally immediately gives us theory for things, right? Um, it gives us a way to, to have a broader repertoire. Um, but if, if we're still ignorant of certain types of connections scientifically, um, system science uh, isn't going to, uh, you know, magically remedy that. Um, and I think this issue that Hind is uh, putting a, a comment on here, um, you know, is, is an important one. And, and it's kind of emblematic of similar issues with, um, in the other spheres. Um, uh, you know, I think about the relationship between psychosocial stressors and health, for example, um, or syndemics involving multiple conditions. We've, we've looked at quite a few syndemics. Uh, um, Xia Yan has, has looked at, you know, side by side COVID-19, um, Excuse me, uh, Nasteron, COVID 19, and influenza, Xiaoyan, uh, and, and chickenpox, and uh, measles. Um, we've looked at TB and diabetes in, in early, much earlier work. We've looked at uh, you know, cigarette smoking and TB. Um, things that are often considered in isolation can be fruitfully viewed together and sometimes need to be viewed together. Um, if it requires nothing more than looking at uh, health disparities in Canada to find that um, many of the communities that are hardest hit by chronic diseases are also hardest hit by, you know, infectious uh, conditions as well, as well as uh, often, um, you know, uh, it, issues concerning um, behavioral uh, burdens such as uh, such as involved in, in substance use and um, and some, some of the uh, some of the factors involved in, in behavioral responses like uh, cigarette smoking, and um, I think you know one of the things we run into all the time with applying system science approaches is um, needing to, um, uh, to to recognize that sometimes the theory is not developed yet in a given area, and and I want to draw attention to something here. It's an important point that it, you know I, I will often emphasize in other contexts like my August boot camp, but which I haven't mentioned here. Models of the sort that we're talking about in this boot camp are, are, are in a class of models which and, and they're used for what we call models for theory explication. This is terminology from Ross Hammond, formerly of Brookings, now at, at, um, at Washington University in St. Louis. Um, models for theory exp explication take a theory that is somewhat established, at least at some level, the, the outlines of it are at least clear, and it explicates what its, what its logical implications are. It, it helps us understand um, it in in its its implications. There's um, there are many cases though where the theory is not yet established, um, where the you know we don't have scientific understanding, for example, yet um, fully in, in long COVID. There's there's several 
you know, competing lines of explanation, dysbiosis, uh, so disruption of the microbiome, um, inflammation and, and, you know, an inflammatory syndrome, similar to what we have in lupus and, and of course, which is known in MECFS and other conditions. Um, there's a reactivation of viral reservoirs or viral fragments in multiple organ systems. And these are kind of competing hypotheses to explain things like co post-COVID uh, fatigue syndrome as compared to post-severe COVID syndrome, which is maybe more secondary to severe organ damage and, and treatment um, uh, response to treatment. The, this is an example where the theory isn't fully there yet, and we're developing that theory. And models in those cases, and in cases involving you know, interactions between psycho psychosocial stressors and outcomes, some mental health issues, models there can often be used for theory building. Um, and the relationship of the models to data for theory explication is much, much, much closer. Models for theory building often involve um, models which are thinking tools used to kind of just think through consistently how certain things would interact. And they're often less closely um, contingent upon data. They're less tied in with data but they're very valuable types of models. Um, they can help us think through, you know, the impact of Porges, uh, um, you know, uh, polyvagal theory or, or think through, um, you know, theories involving development of mental health and its impact on substance use, et cetera. And um, there's limits to what system science um, can do with models for theory explication in areas where the theory isn't developed. But there, system science often plays a role in building theory and trying out ideas, trying them on for size, testing how they might work together, um, and, and using them to kind of um, as a more perfect mirror to think through observations. So um, just be aware that you know, how system science plays a role is different in, in different spheres. Um, um, and, you know, with interaction with, um, uh, with resp different respiratory pathogens, um, I think this is, you know, an, an interesting area where there needs to be more scientific evidence um, that would suggest um, some components of, you know, how risk of pertussis might be um, might be worsened by exposure to, to other, uh, other pathogens, for example, um, or how vaccination might lead to uh, cross protection from other, other pathogens, et cetera. For example, it is known that, um, uh, that immunization for, for influenza might um, confer some, some protection against um, COVID-19 as well. So anyway, I'll, um, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I agree there's limits there. And you know, often models are tools for allowing us to, to, to test out our theories, but when the theories are absent, um, while the models could express theories in that area, um, how they relate to possible theories is different. They're used for theory building and often that they have less direct relationship to data and more of a, of a kind of role being used in a flexible uh, exploratory fashion. Any other comments, questions I can address? Yeah, sure, glad, glad if I offered some value. Okay, um, uh, well, we're, um, we're a little bit thrown off um, for, um, for time here. Um, uh, I don't wanna in any way minimize um, the, um, uh, the value of this discussion, um, uh, and and I, I welcome this discussion. This is the most important thing to have. I, I see this a question: uh, uh, when there's lack of theory, do people use intuition on the situation to create theory? Well, I mean, you can use intuition. Often, there's little pieces we know, right? There's there's regularities we observe from the world. We may not have theory, but we may have built up a certain um, a certain um, awareness of certain features of the situation. And often models can take it out of our head um, 
and, and try to knit together what we do know in little bits and pieces. And as Hinn said, you know, um, uh, these can include empirical observations historically, but also lab experiments, potentially, uh, you know, animal studies in, in labs. Uh, um, it can also include, you know, clinical observations, et cetera. And there's no shortage of, of theories that are kind of broad um, that uh, try to advance, you know, theorizing, uh, you know, about broad areas. Um, I've mentioned Porch's work earlier. I know there's work in, in um, mental health and addictions like this, you know, in, in, in governing um, um, substance use, for example. Um, and, and often we can use those to kind of try out ideas. I know there's also a cottage industry, yeah, practice-based knowledge, exactly, from clinical practice. Um, 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 uh, there's some wonderful uh, editorializing on, you know, um, on the use of, of a system science lens here or, or that is germane to it, you know, to, um, to, to give us more evidence-based practice, we need more uh, practice-based evidence. Um, and, and I think models provide a way of tapping in to some of that uh, practice-based knowledge in, in important ways. Um, uh, but you know, here, um, there's no shortage of theories in the health side, as people will probably be aware. Um, what goes by the term theory in, in the health side is, or, or model, I should say, in the health side is a little bit different from the models we're talking about, but you know, the health belief model or, or, or the theory of reasoned action, um, the trans theoretical model. Um, these various types of models, which are often, you know, conceptual constructs that are useful, but they're not directly, they're not precise and, and testable. I, I'm, I'm not saying they're, they're not valuable. They really are, but they're, they're not models in the same sense we're talking about here. Very precise assumptions that can be then run and tested and understand their implications. But there's a, there's quite a lot of uses of models, including agent-based models in particular, to kind of that are inspired by those general theories or 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 you know uh, models, um, but um, which then um, uh, which then are used for thinking tools. Um, they're used for for uh, um, for for thinking through um, theory in this area and maybe making sense of it with evidence. And I think there's a lot of a lot of potential for that. Um, thanks. Uh, glad, it, glad if this is useful. Um, uh, it is discussion, this issue of models as tools for theorizing is something that is, is actualized in, in many spheres. And some of those at greatest, um, you know, who are, who are strong practitioners um, in practice-based evidence. My colleague, Kurt Stange at, 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 at Case Western, for example, and our collaborator on, on some of our work, sponsor of three hackathons that we've run, um, or, um, or you know, some of uh, what goes on in biology labs actually uses these sort of models to stimulate theory, to interpret things, to think through the what we're seeing evidence-wise, trying it out, you know, gosh, is it consistent with this model or that model? And again, it's it's a different relationship. Often it's more free-flowing. Um, think about how to how to explain this best with models. And it is germane to this boot camp because there's some really neat work going on in and inferring model structure from observed data that's very, very interesting. And, um, uh, you know, given enough data, maybe it's data from wearables and smartphones and, you know, um, from, from environmental sensors or whatever, you might be able to, to start to understand some features of, of governing processes, at least operating right now, if not necessarily causal structures. And, um, and I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of value for, for thinking about this um, as well in a systems data science context. Okay, so I think we'll stop, um, stop now if we could. I'll, um, once again, like yesterday, I'm gonna 
um, shut this uh, shut this off so we can get the the videos downloaded. You may have seen I've been posting a lot of videos in the last day. I think um, they seem to have been well visited by somebody. I don't know if it's you know places here, or people here, or pe people on the broader internet, but they've already achieved some currency. And uh, we'll see if we can get these new ones up there. Um, it's uh, 1215, so I think we'll reconvene in an hour. Um, and uh, uh, there'll be 115, and we'll take it from there, OK? Um, thank you very much. And I look forward to, to coming back. And I treasure these sort of interactions with the chatter verbally. Uh, so let's. Um, kudos to those who have put those forward and let's keep them going. Thanks so much and see you at 115. Thanks.